Talk dirty to me, Gabe. Talk pod to me. <laughs> well, actually, that's not healthy. <laughs> Don't talk pod to me. <laughs> Let's <your> neither. Pod. <laughs> Where have you been putting your pod lately? <laughs> okay, your pod's showing. <laughs> not again. <laughs> Dominic, put your pod back in its pants where it belongs. <laughs> put your pod away, darling. We've seen it enough. Good God. Hi, Kay. Hi, Dominic. How are you going today? I'm fabulous. And how are you? I too am fabulous. We are just having a blast because we've not seen each other in a couple of weeks. Although you, our listeners, our beautiful, beautiful listeners, have had the luxury of a new episode each week. We didn't take a break over the uh, you know release of episodes over Christmas and New Year. But we, Dominic and I, have not seen each other since Christmas Day. And, you know, we're excited to be here and excited to be back. So much to catch up on. And this is our technically first recorded episode of 2023 even though we've already released a couple which kate they have been smashed out of the park people are loving spanish donkey and amityville <laughs> murders absolutely as they should i mean two very different stories but <laughs> two very good stories so if you've not listened to those yet go back and have a listen particularly spanish donkey we went a little while with the title it is a torture device so it's all about torture um yeah. and it was one of my favorite episodes to record <laughs> so <laughs> check it out if you haven't already just a bit of casual torture between yeah, kate and I. it's quite absolutely quite normal yeah Nice. It's like usual. It's different. Mm -hmm. Dom, do you have any housekeeping before I get into today's episode? Yes, we do have housekeeping. Um, In the past couple of episodes, we've talked about a very special interview that we've been doing uh, or did have done. We did. It was with uh, the amazing podcast called Dying to be Found. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Deborah. That sounds like my acting career. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and her team, her sister, um, and everyone that works on the pod. So if you haven't heard of Dying to Be Found, please go check it out. But the special mini-sode that we did with Deborah is going to be released sometime in February, and we're mm-hmm. going to get access to it as well. So we will share it here for everybody. So please keep an eye out for that. Absolutely. And then uh, no Boo Pod Network news just as yet, but I'm sure that there's plenty of fun, cool things cooking in the background. So we're excited for 2023. We'll obviously be doing some sort of Halloween special, but that's not for a while yet. So yeah. uh, please stay tuned for that. But as usual, folks, it's really, really important that not only do you go check out our Facebook and Instagram and TikTok at Shitting Bricks Podcast, but um, you should also please go check out our patreon because we're releasing more special uh mini sodes and um behind the scenes stuff on there on the regulars absolutely and you can obviously find that at shitting bricks podcast but last but not least kate and i really need everyone's help this year this year is going to be our year of reviews we really appreciate and love all the folks that leave lovely reviews of our podcast and if you haven't one done done one yet please do just take that extra 10 15 seconds to go rate and review us on whatever platform you're using because it actually makes a huge difference in us getting seen by other listeners so yeah. at the end of this episode please just go give us a nice honest five star review because <laughs> what else would you give us the five star part exactly um and we'll be ever so grateful but apart from that kate that is the end of housekeeping (laughs) fabulous thank you dom i love you catching us up on all the biz and the news and the things that we need to know one of the things that i did over the christmas holiday break was i listened to quite a few podcasts and uh one that i was listening to i'm not going to name it because it's quite popular and i didn't love it however the start of it it wasn't five stars kate was it it's not not five stars for me but that's okay a lot of people think it is and that's totally fine however one of the things that i found was that we were 20 minutes into the episode then not yet started the story and i was uh, screaming into my phone like 
okay, start the story. Please start the story. <laughs> Kate and I have this so, unofficial five-minute rule. Five-minute limit. Exactly right. So I'm already running seven seconds over, which was probably us just talking about pods earlier in the <laughs> before we started. So why don't I kick us off in my usual fashion? I'm going to have a chat to you about a phobia, Dominic, a bit of a phobia. I've missed your classes, Kate. <laughs> Yay! So today I am going to be talking about things that are related to chromatophobia. Oh. Do you want to take a stab, Dom, at what that might be? Look, you're talking to an artist when, whenever I hear the word chrome or chroming or uh -huh. anything. It's yeah. like it's paint, it's aerosol, it's sniff and glue are we True. doing that today it's not that it's not that but write that down that is a potential ebb uh ep. uh chromatophobia is an irrational fear of spending money so oh. today is a financial episode and we are going to be uh discussing a little bit about about money and fears that surround that but the phobia is uh yeah about spending money it's chromatophobia now the etymology of this word is that it originates from the greek words chromata which means money and phobos meaning fear our favorite so it is the fear of spending money now the way that this can impact people's lives when you have a legitimate phobia is that a person may deny themselves necessities that they can afford mm -hmm. they might avoid going out going on vacation or pursuing activities that they enjoy even if it fits in their budget they may develop health problems and refuse to spend money on health care or they choose to buy junk food because it's cheaper than healthy food. They might not have a social life or a romantic relationship because all of that costs money. Is this me? <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> they may develop legal problems due to failure to pay bills. I, I do pay my bills, so that's okay. Um, and their living situation might deteriorate because they don't want to spend money on home maintenance or repairs or, you know, appliances or nice things to have in your home. So that is the phobia around spending money. It's now, sort of like the indirect things that occur if you're not spending money right like yeah it's not like you not using your credit card is going to kill you but it's correct the, it's, the collateral it's, yeah, things they that can't happen. justify that you know i'm not going to go and buy groceries this week i'll just eat ramen and you know ramen's great but not maybe not to live off permanently if you can afford to buy you know some pasta every now and then or some greens I wonder how many people at home are like, oh, my God, I wish my partner had this phobia <laughs> we maxed out like six credit cards. Yeah. And... <laughs> Look, sometimes I do wish I had that phobia, particularly during the school holes, which I'm still on, and I just leave the house and money just falls out of my pockets. I don't even know what I do, but I made the mistake of going to Kmart today. Don't do that. <laughs> but I have pretty things in my house, so we're okay. Now, one of the things that I wanted to look into, aside from this uh, particular phobia, was just around some finance facts, okay? So some of the things which might actually cause people to be in a fearful state. So, you know, money is a cause of stress and anxiety. And, in fact, this entire episode stemmed from a family dinner that we had at your mother and father's house and we were going around the circle and we were saying what is your biggest fear we're doing a podcast on scary things so what is what's your fear and everyone was like yeah torture being murdered uh home alone and hearing noises and then your dad was like and now for those of you that do not have the joy of having a paul taranto in your life he's very considered with how he speaks so everybody just fired off their fears and he sat and he pondered. And then he said, I'm afraid I won't have enough money to retire. <laughs> and then that was it. <laughs> the room went silent. So it sat in the back of my head and I thought, do you know what, Uncle Paul, I'm going to do an episode around this and we'll discuss a little bit about why people are scared of that. So I had a bit of a squizzy. If you want to retire at 60 in Australia, so naturally we've got listeners all over the world, but in Australia, if you want to retire at 60, a common approximation used to calculate the amount that you need to retire is to multiply your after-tax retirement expenses by 15. Okay. So if you estimate that you need 50000 annually in retirement income, then you need income generating assets of $750,000 to create this income stream. Mm -hmm. 
I, for one, at this point in my life, do not have that. <laughs> do, you, do you have that, Tom? Um, I will have a mortgage, which will hopefully go. get me to a point where I Perfect. will have that. I love that. Fantastic. <laughs> now that much is right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> now that is in Australia. Now I had a quick look at some of the other, you know, countries and places. So I thought, why not go to uh, New York City just to see the little bit of a difference in uh what you might need so if you want to retire under the lights of new york city you need at least 2.8 million dollars in savings oh. so their social security is not as um i don't know functional. generous functional <laughs> Now, they um, wrote on uh, a smart assets report and determined the average savings needed to retire in the least affordable cities for retirees, assuming that that's a 30-year retirement. So use of lots of data from statistics and all of that sort of stuff. Um, that's the standard of living for seniors in each particular city. But in New York, uh, it is $2.8 million. Okay. okay. So keep that in the back of your mind it's a fear people have will i have enough money to retire on do i have enough money to go on a holiday buy a house you know all of those fantastic things um so one of the things people might do is invest their mm. money which brings me to our title of the episode today which is to talk to you a little bit about ponzi schemes <laughs> welcome to the pod charles ponzi hello <laughs> Take a seat with Maggie. She'll sort you out. Maggie? Maggie. Oh, I was thinking of Margaret Thatcher for some reason. Maggie's come to have a cup of tea with Liz Trust and now Mr Ponzi. Oh, God, we've got Charles Ponzi, Margaret Thatcher and Lizzie Trust. That's amazing. Maggie's come back say, from, the, from the grave. Um, yeah, Liz's Ponzi is hanging out. Maggie's yeah. Pod's hanging out. And Ponzi's <laughs> Phobos is just Charles waiting. Just, oh, he's just flipping in the breeze. All right, so let me give you a rundown because I had to look up the difference between a Ponzi scheme and a pyramid scheme. So they are similar in ways. A standard Ponzi scheme is a fraudulent investment scheme in which an operator, so the, the head honcho, whoever the person is, pays returns on investments from capital derived from new investors rather than from legitimate investment profits. Ponzi scheme operators entice new investors with abnormally high short-term rates of return. I will get into more information about this. If this already sounds like it's boring you, I will jazz it up. Don't stress. Now, pyramid scheme, which is also called a chain referral scheme, is a fraudulent business model in which new members are recruited with promises of payment tiered to their ability to enroll future members in the scheme. So as the membership pool expands exponentially, further recruiting becomes nearly impossible and the business, inverted commas, becomes unsustainable. Yeah. So whilst they do have a lot of crossover, they are different. So if you think, you know, like Tupperware, Tupperware is a pyramid scheme. Uh, any of those beauty products or any of those things where, you know, they're requesting you to join as a member to sell those products, that's where that kind of income's generated. Whereas a Ponzi scheme, you're giving your money to person A and they're going to take care of investments for you. But in order to pay you, they need to find someone else to basically pay your bills. So... Let me have a bit of a chat to you about Charles Ponzi, who, you know, namesake, he was the one who got to, um, yeah, everybody thinks of him now when they think of a fraudulent business operation, which is great. Uh, now. Memorable, Mum, look at me. <laughs> so, thanks. <laughs> now. Um, Again, a Ponzi scheme is a fraudulent business operation. It promises investors high return on investment with little risk. Projected returns in excess of 50%, wink, wink, are sometimes offered to entice one to invest. In return, investors are led to believe that their money will be invested in a legitimate business operation and they receive regular cash returns on their investment. In reality, all their money goes to earlier investors and their returns come from funds collected from new investors. The scheme is based upon the ability to attract new investors because without these, there's no ability to pay other people. Now, the first Ponzi scheme was orchestrated by an Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi in 1919. Okay, so we're going back a ways. What is it about my people? We could just... Uh, it's... Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I can't help you. I mean, I I love I love Italians, so I'm here for it. Um, I would have been Ponzi's friend for sure. <laughs> now, 
At the time, it was typical for a government to allow individuals to redeem postal stamps for local currency. Ponzi intended to capitalise on this system by purchasing po postal stamps from a foreign country and holding them until their currency's value increased. Friends and family of Ponzi joined this venture by providing the necessary money to invest in the operation. Ponzi promised a 10% return each month, which created buzz for his venture because banks were only offering a 5% return per year. Mm -hmm. So straight away, guys, one of the pieces of advice I'm going to give you, and it is just, it's the moral of this entire story, is if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Full stop. Uh, now, Ponzi was entrusted with approximately $15 million from investors. Now, $15 million in 1919 equates to approximately $258 million in today's money. So that is a shit ton of money that yes. he has got. Shit and bricks load. Shit bricks load. Now, he used new money, inverted commas, to provide fake returns to old investors, inverted commas. When it was discovered that Ponzi was becoming bankrupt, investors demanded their money back and Ponzi's scheme was finally uncovered. He was unable to return approximately four million of that money and he was convicted for his crimes. He pled guilty to mail fraud and he spent time in federal and state prison before he was deported to Italy. Now, a key aspect for a Ponzi scheme to succeed is the promise of high returns with minimal risk. These individuals need a way to draw attention to the scheme so that they develop and provide individuals with unheard of profits. Many investors tend to question the high rates of return and the orchestrator of the plan has to have a believable story. So the story has to show investors that there's something reasonable they're investing in. So it can range from anything like um, banks and mortgages or international manufacturing companies so that they look legit. Yeah. The key to making this story believable is the use of diverse, complex and unique situations. Once an investor has been drawn into a scheme, the individual conducting the operation must work to gain investor trust and conceal the truth for as long as possible. This would be so stressful. Yeah, like no this... wonder they were on drugs. And... <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Once the trust of investors has been fully gained, the orchestrator must meet this trust with promised payments. These payments must be made on time in order to verify the initial story and not create any cause for concern. This keeps investors happy and allows them to not question the operation because they're receiving returns on their investments. Because the money received from investors is not actually being invested, but it's just going to pay the supposed returns of the other investors, the operation collapses when there are no new investors. The cycle has to be sustained in order for the individual's work to go unnoticed. And this is why it's so important to attract new investors with the high rate of return and low risk and those believable yet attractive stories. So that is the origin of the Ponzi scheme. Chucky okay. Pons, he bought stamps and then took a whole bunch of people's money. Wow. He would have just he was just living the high life. I'd never heard of the actual story story. Like I I knew that it was based off of him. I knew his background and things like that, but I didn't know the details of his particular yeah. scheme. Well, yeah, I mean, by the looks of it, in terms of, yeah, what I what I read and, and what I was looking into uh, earlier was that, yeah, the postage stamp started off as that, you know, investment opportunity. But then once he started getting so much money from people to invest in this, it just diversified. He just, yeah. again, he had to make up more stories. stories and he had yeah. to pretend that he's investing in all sorts of companies and businesses all over the world so that people would be like, yeah, that's legit. Here's more money. All right. So that's Charles Ponzi. Let's have a chat about a couple of examples that took a leaf out of his book, shall we? Mm -hmm. Lou Pearlman. Do you know oh. Lou Pearlman, Dom? I do like pearls. Oh, Does okay. That help? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that helps. Sure. Um, well, you let me know if it helps by the <laughs> end of this story. Now, Lou Pearlman. Before he was implicated in one of the largest Ponzi schemes in US history, Lou, Perlman, Lou Perlman's lies started to unravel at a meal with NSYNC at a Los Angeles steakhouse. Okay, now that's a sentence <laughs> I would never have expected to be ever uttered this on is great. <laughs> I love this because, again, at when, which is just my modus operandi, when I was looking for stories and looking for things to include, I'm like, 
who are these people? When did all these things happen? I don't know anything that's going on in the world. And usually when I say, you dumb, do you know this? And you're like, yeah, I know that story. I've seen 16 documentaries and I read four <laughs> books and I like know the ins and outs of the duck's ass. But this is good. I might be able to give you some new info today. Yeah, you are. I'm okay. getting schooled and I'm loving Yay. it. And all right. I'm such an NSYNC fan. <laughs> Perfect. This is great. Okay, so Lou Perlman is sitting around the table with NSYNC and their families at L L Lowry's, Lowry's, L-A-W-R-Y-S, Lowry's, Lowry, yeah. Mike Lowry. Mike Lowry. Mike Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> People, if you don't know what we're doing, <laughs> please do yourself a favour and search Mike Lowry. Mike Lowry. Uh, now, he was at Lowry's prime rib in Beverly Hills around 1999. The boy band members who lived on a $35 per diem at the time, these guys are like massive and they've got $35 in their pocket. That's I did absurd. know that. I did okay. actually know that. That's scary. Now, they were super excited at this steak dinner to find out how much windfall awaited them after their debut album sold, sold more than 10 million copies. Boy band fever was sweeping the nation and young girls wearing T-shirts, buying CDs, holding signs outside MTV's TRL, throwback, um, and most importantly, they were screaming their lungs out every time that they saw that band. So Chris Kirkpatrick, who was Chris from NSYNC, uh, you know, he was thinking, I'm king of the castle at this point. And he says this in a uh, documentary, which is called The Boy Band Con, The Lou Perlman Story. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can go ahead and watch if you're so, you know, interested. Um, and that was, yeah, it was uh, produced by Lance Bass, essentially yeah. put it together. Now, the man that they had to thank for the worldwide success was Perlman, the jovial cherubic mastermind who went from outfitting luxury jets for rock stars to becoming the Berry Gordy of the 90s boy band craze, simultaneously managing the era's two competing juggernauts, NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. But when the guys at the steakhouse opened up the envelopes that Perlman gave them at their first check presentation, their hearts sank. NSYNC's JC Chases, Chases, Chase, Chases, how do you pronounce his surname? JC. He said he was expecting there to be, you know, some big magical check for selling millions of records, touring with Janet Jackson, dominating the charts, sending teen girls into hysterics. Instead, their checks barely eclipsed four figures. Yep. That sucks. Yeah, all of that work, and that's all they got paid. They got he's thirty five dollars, and he's a thousand just for your, you know, buy some new sneakers. I don't know, get your hair refrosted or whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> it's a dollar for every tip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, Lance Bass said in the film that you know he's not to sound ungrateful, but when you compare it to how many hours we had to put in this group for years, it didn't even touch minimum wage. The boys' parents were equally upset. I just wanted to kill him, Lynn Harless, Justin Timberlake's mother says in the film. Not to be outdone by his mum, Timberlake once described the period as being financially raped by a Svengali. Yeah. Heavy words. That's, that's an image. That is quite, yeah. <laughs> Svengali's got a real look too, so it's a, it's a lot going on there. Now, unbeknownst to the band, however, the fraud Perlman was committing to the darlings of 90s pop music was just one of the illicit games that he was running. For more than 20 years, Perlman was also defrauding thousands of investors in a fictitious airline that he created in Orlando for more than $300 million. In 2007, and when you see pictures of this guy too, you're like, really? This is wild. Like, I feel, you know, it's a big part of being charismatic and selling stuff and doing whatever. And this looks like, you know, a soccer dad. Like, yeah. and, you know, they do go on, I'll read a little bit later, but even the NSYNC band members, they were like, you know, he really helped us out and, like, got us through stuff. Some other people said some other things, but we'll get there too. I can and sort of just imagine him creating, like, a little advertisement of his airplane air, yes. air, air, and like and it's like a toy plane with some yes. string attached it's like the thunderbirds it's like yeah yeah we just yeah, released him best <laughs> 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 they got on the bye 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 in the background <laughs> bye 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 <laughs> Yeah, we can do 
marketing. Look at us, we guys. Hire us. We just absolutely scheme. nailed that. We could. We really could. In 2007, Perlman was indicted and later sentenced to 25 years for conspiracy, money laundering, and making false statements during a bankruptcy proceeding. He died from cardiac arrest at the age of 62 in 2016. Stressful. Yes. In the documentary co-produced by Lance Bass, uh, many of the stars, the fallen impresario helped to create, spoke out about his life uh, and then what went wrong and also the scams that affected thousands of people. Bass said that I don't think Lou felt bad at all. I think he really believed that the world owed him all of this. Mm. And this is a common theme with the people that perpetrate these crimes. At no point do they you know show much remorse for what it is that they're doing uh and it's yeah it's sickening that's what the most frightening part to me is mm -hmm. now bass who was uh then 16 year old um he flew out to orlando in 95 on a recommendation from timberlake and harless to try it for the group which they recently had a member drop out of now when he landed he saw perlman didn't have just a rolls royce at the airport but also for reasons that remain unclear to bass a limousine so here's a roller and a limo. You pick whichever car. <laughs> You're not even thinking this guy could be a crook, Bass told the Post. When someone promises you the world, you believe in him. Now, if I ever met someone who popped up like a peacock in the beginning, I'm like, yeah, you're full of shit. Also a good piece of advice. If any <laughs> peacocks pop up at the start of anything, you can be like, nah, you're, you're full of it. Get out of here. It wasn't always bad between the manager and his boy bands, as many of them reflect in the boy band con, Doco. Uh, the Queen's native, often referred to as Big Papa, was a father figure who helped the young men grow up when they needed it most. But other boy band members have accused Perlman of sexually assaulting them. According to a 2007 Vanity Fair story, Perlman denied those allegations. Uh, it was like Peter Pan and the Lost Boy. O-Town's Ashley Parker Angel says in the documentary. Perlman's yeah. lies, yeah, I did. I knew when I started reading this article and sort of looked at some of the pictures, I was like, that's ringing bells. Like something popped up about this that's nefarious and I don't love it. Um, yes, so I just thought I'd just include that in there. Uh, Perlman's lies were apparent from the start, even if the band members couldn't recognise them in the moment. I remember Lou coming to me and saving, saying, well, you know you'll have a number one album, right? And I go, why? And he goes, well, I bought all the albums to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> he said he bought 250,000 albums to make sure we were number one, Bass recalled. I thought, of course he did. I know that it's a complete lie now, but I just thought he was professional and that's the way the business worked. <laughs> if you're 16, you don't know any bloody different. You don't know anything. This is wild. This is the kind of like money and fame and power that they would have no clue about. So of course they're just going to be like, yeah, okay, that sounds right. You just buy the, and just go into borders and just buy every single instinct CD. <laughs> just drop a trolley around Knox City and just grab all the discs. Ah, oh, goodness me. Now in uh, the years, <laughs> sorry. to sanity. By the way, my old. My first ever proper retail job, Sanity, which is a CD and DVD store, is closing down officially in Australia oh, and I'm devastated. But I'm so sorry for that. Oh, that was such a good time. It was the best first job any you, kid could ever have. Oh, you had the greatest CD collection ever. <laughs> I still remember it. And how, did you put the stickers with your name on them or did die? Mum got them printed yeah. okay. and then taught me to be that that yeah. person that labels okay. everything that you yeah. own so and the, no one it, it. it wasn't just your name like on a little dymo these were like decorated custom printed dominic taranto stickers they were it was, it was a jukebox yes that's right a jukebox <laughs> oh my gosh so good oh I'm getting flashbacks so in the years that followed messy lawsuits from NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, both of whom severed all ties with Lou after multi-million dollar settlements in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, Lou Perlman found himself trying to recreate the magic of those 90s pioneers. But it wasn't his later groups like O-Town that got the attention of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 2006. It was his dealings in the fictional transcontinental airlines and the roughly 2,100 people who invested in the fake company, according to the film. 
After coordinating hundreds of millions of dollars in fraudulent activity by promising investments that were insured by the FDIC, Perlman fled the country reportedly to Israel and Germany. He was finally apprehended by the FBI at a hotel in Bali in June 2007 when a German couple alerted authorities that they had spotted him staying there. When Perlman died while in custody at the Federal Correctional Institution in Miami, some artists interviewed in the film who were previously managed by him said that they felt a sense of relief as several of them accused him of financial or psychological abuse. Mm. That is our Lou Perlman portion of today's program. Oh, he's put a bit of a bad taste in my mouth after. Like, mm. that's just horrible. That level of destruction. Fin- I think financial destruction to me. Yeah. And that's what this this episode is screaming to me theme-wise right. is just financial destruction. It was the same with the lottery episode that you did, Kate. Just mm. finances can just cause and wreak so much havoc yeah on not just an individual but it, it's like a cancer it just yeah absolutely and it's one of those things too because i have a a very low-key interest uh in this sort of stuff in the sense that like financially i am not invested in companies at this present moment to be looking after my finances nor do i have many properties and things like that where you do have to put your trust in other human beings to take care of this stuff for you and you don't know obviously there are ways and there's things that you can do to make sure that you're okay and there's rules and regulations and all that sort of stuff but holy moly it's it's devastating it's properly devastating and to think that Lou's sitting there at this steakhouse and gives these kids and their parents a check for a thousand bucks each was like five grand six grand that he's outlaid when he is happily taking $300 million from, you know, people all over the world. And he just like, yeah, that's it. That's how it goes. That's how much you get. Famous though. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I feel it, please. Um, (laughs) It's just, it's just not. There's something, yeah, it's, there's, it's just that sociopath behavior. That's crazy. Okay. So that is Louis Pearl's now let me tell you a little story about Scott Rothstein. Do you know of this person? I know the name. Okay, fab. I love this. I'm so excited I get to share a story with you. <laughs> the photographs on the walls of Scott Rothstein's office at his law firm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, were a who's who of Washington. There were photos of Rothstein shaking hands with former President George W. Bush and Rothstein with Bush's brother Jeb, who is Florida's former governor, more photos showed Rothstein glad handling. I need to use that more Ooh. often. <laughs> I got a really good glad handling oh, last night. Ooh. Tell you what, the glad handles down at the local are just absolutely off the charts. Hit the spot. More photos showed Rothstein glad handling Sarah Palin, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Bill Richardson. And then there were the senators: Joe Lieberman, Mel Martinez, Arlen Specter, and John McCain. I only know John McCain. I don't know the other ones. Uh, All appeared to be happy in the company of a man who, by some estimates, contributed at least $1.9 million to local and national political campaigns. The problem is the money was dirty. Mm. Rothstein, 47, has been called the Bernie Madoff of South Florida. Now, I have yet to mention Bernie's name this pod so far uh but bear with me i will i will touch on that but if you're not sure who bernie madoff is uh, i'm going to teach you all about that uh just know that he also conducted a ponzi scheme rostein pleaded guilty in january 20 uh, on january 27th to five federal charges this is in 2010 by the way, I didn't specify the year, but January 27, 2010, to five federal charges, including racketeering, money laundering, and fraud. Under his plea agreement, he admitted in court that he masterminded the largest Ponzi scheme in South Florida history. He was uh, scheduled to be sentenced on May 6. The maximum sentence under federal guidelines is 100 years, but he could receive some credit for turning himself in, surrendering his assets, and pleading guilty early in the case. Rothstein's prized political photos, along with the framed thank you notes and luxurious office furniture, were auctioned in 2010 to help pay down his $1.2 billion debt to investors. 
a political photo depicting Florida Governor at the time, Charlie Crist and Rostein in a happy embrace sign, Scott, you're amazing, fetched $2,100. <laughs> A little chicken that's to- at one point, whatever. 1.2 billion. billion. Yeah, that's right. And a limited edition designer pen went for $3,250. For a pen. For a Jesus. pen. A limited edition designer pen. People have, sometimes people have too much money to spend on things. Yeah. While the auction netted nearly $200,000, that's it, $1.2 <laughs> billion, 200,000, like it's not even in the 1.2 bit, like it's the numbers <laughs> after that. It's, it doesn't even make it into the 1.2. <laughs> Which number is it, Kate? <laughs> it doesn't even. It's one of the other ones, I'm sure of it. I don't know. I've been looking at numbers all day. Now, whilst the auction netted nearly 200,000, it won't come close to paying back the investors, nor will it repair what may be lasting damage Rothstein did to the political, charitable and social fabric of South Florida. Oh, this is Florida is such a, <laughs> such a fucking angelic political yeah, landscape. Yeah, it there. is. Uh, Rothstein has been behind bars since December 1st, 2010, um, and could not be reached for comment. Yeah, because he's busy. Like he's got things to do. He doesn't get a lot of phone time, no doubt. His lawyer, Mark Nurick, said Rothstein has taken a very unusual step by surrendering and turning his assets over to federal authorities. Those assets are estimated to be close uh, to around $100 million, he said. So he accepted full responsibility for his actions, Nurick said. His intent was to see that all legitimate investors got their money back. What does that mean, legitimate investors? (laughs) Mini Madoff, as some of the locals called him. Uh, was a fixture on the Fort Lauderdale social scene and a large donor to local charities. Now, I haven't spoken very much, uh, or if if at all, about the victims. Um, I mean, yes, NSYNC Backstreet Boys touched on that. But when Holy Cross Hospital in Fort Lauderdale learned of the trouble, it had to return his $1 million donation. Another charity, Family Central Inc., which subsidised childcare for the working poor, had to return a $25,000 donation. See that? Bullshit. Isn't that shit? Like that's a hospital and a place that subsidizes childcare. And that you know, had to return the money. Uh, that's the saddest part of this, the charities. It's terrible that the man's crime would impact them, said Bob Norman. Bob Norman is a reporter and a blogger who had been writing nearly two Rothstein stories a day to feed readers insatiable appetite about the scandal. This guy wasn't just any old lawyer, Norman said. You couldn't go anywhere here without hearing this guy's name or seeing his image. It's like Madoff but on crap, Norman said. He did it a whole lot faster and a whole lot wilder. A huge billboard rose in the centre of Fort Lauderdale showing Rothstein with former football star Dan Marino. There were ads everywhere promoting his restaurants and at the Miami Dolphins games, Rothstein's name was announced as a sponsor. He paid big bucks to get his name out there and absolutely all of that money was stolen, Norman said. Norman started investigating Rothstein in 2008, long before the Ponzi scheme story broke. The way Norman saw it, Rothstein's rise to power in South Florida happened too quickly. So there's another little hint and a handy tip for you as well. If you're planning on um, starting and operating a Ponzi scheme, don't do it too fast because you'll arouse suspicion. You just got to do it nice and slow. Yeah. Just, you know, pop that money in your piggy bank. Yeah. Yeah. Rothstein grew his law firm, Rothstein Rosenfeld Adler, now defunct, from a five-lawyer operation in 2005 to one that employed 70 lawyers and 150 staff members. The firm's staff included former judges, prosecutors, big-name attorneys and ex-police brass. Rothstein showered gifts on all of them, including exotic cars, jewellery and boats, according to court papers. To Norman, the money Rothstein spent on his friends and himself was just too much. He didn't have one Bentley, he had three Bentleys. He had 20 luxury cars he kept in an air-conditioned warehouse, Norman said. Everyone in town was looking at him and asking, where is he getting all this money? He's a lawyer. And and even the most successful lawyer in this town wasn't throwing around money the way he was. The way I initially read that was like, he's a lawyer and he's not even good. (laughs) Did he ever actually practice law? <laughs> oh, I think he must have been too busy counting all everybody else's money. Now, when the news of the Ponzi scheme broke, someone sent Norman a photo of Rothstein's his and hers toilets. The lids were gold-plated and each was estimated to cost $25,000. Oh, come on, folks. If you have, come on. 
you have a gold plated crapper and this is a <laughs> this is a podcast called shitting bricks it Even is we don't agree with that our award for our first patreon subscriber was the golden shitter yeah and i spent we spent like 30 bucks on that yeah game. sorry chel but it was, that <laughs> you was can, a lot there's ways us. you can do it yeah i mean go on pinterest i'm sure you could like find a cheaper way to do it i'm sure kmart's got something that looks just like it uh norman said one of rostein's investors told him i was lulled into believing this myth that he created i really believed he had a golden touch what better way to perpetuate my myth than by having a golden toilet i was about to say <laughs> golden touch or golden toilet <laughs> yeah, both. federal authorities said rothstein used his political contributions his donations to charities the power of his firm and his own personal displays of wealth to earn respect and attract potential investors in his ponzi scheme According to the authorities, the scheme worked this way. Rothstein invited wealthy investors to his office. He told them that he had clients who didn't want to wait to collect settlement agreements in sexual harassment and or whistleblower cases. Rothstein told potential investors the confidential settlement agreements were available for purchase. He said the clients didn't want to wait for these agreements to pay out over time. They'd take the money at a discount if they could get it in a lump sum. The investors were promised their money back plus the difference. The trouble is, federal authorities say, the clients and their cases never existed. Uh, Rothstein, yeah, so he's basically got fake settlements. He goes, you buy this settlement because Samantha Smith doesn't want to wait for six months to get her cash, so you buy it off me, discount, here's the money, but they were not real. Rothstein used altered bank statements, fictitious online bank accounts and fictitious documents to convince investors that the cases were real. Uh, hedge fund managers, I learned what a hedge fund was um, this week as well. Thank you. I'm not going to go into it right now, but I promise there'll be more about that. Uh, hedge fund managers, sophisticated trust directors and his friends invested with Rothstein. Rothstein's scam collapsed in October when he ran out of money to pay back investors shock when he realized there was trouble investigators said he wired 16 million dollars to an offshore account and fled to morocco in a private jet he returned a couple of weeks later and explained why in an exclusive interview with cnn affiliate wsvn Did he oh, what, kind of, <laughs> what kind of voice would this guy have i was just about to load into this one. i went away to my, but i don't he's not like a 90 year old man so all right, I'll just go with my voice. I went away to make sure I had my head on straight. I had been through all the emotional things and went through the hysterics, all the things you go through when you've done things that you shouldn't, Rothstein told WSVN. I will not stop until every penny is paid back, he said at the time. An attorney for some of the investors, uh, William Shearer, said he thinks Rothstein will be the best witness for his clients when the civil case makes it to court. I mean, what does he have to lose? Shira said he was a great salesman and I just hope that we can sell the jury. He said if anyone can steal over a billion without a gun, they've got to be good at something. <laughs> That's a really good point. good point. Federal investigators said that the investigation continues. This article was published in 2010, so I do have an update for you, but this is just verbatim from that article. They are looking into Rothstein's associates, checking to see who else might have been in on the scheme. Rothstein's lawyer, Nurek, said his client is not pointing the finger at anyone else. He, Rothstein, says hello in court, but no, he's not cooperating with the federal authorities other than identifying his assets, which is what he's done so far. He said, the investigation's far from over. We will con continue to unweave the schemes on the house of cards that he built, said John Gillies, chief of the FBI's Miami office. To investors, I tell you, be aware. To those out there perpetuating these kinds of crimes, beware we will catch you <laughs> scott rothstein was sentenced to 50 years in federal prison for using his fort lauderdale firm to run a 1.2 billion dollar bernie madoff style ponzi scheme that bought him yachts sports cars and allowed him to make sizable contributions to floridian politicians rothstein did face up to 100 years behind bars after pleading guilty in in january to two counts of fraud three counts of conspiracy the sentence imposed by James, Judge James Conn, however, is 10 years more than the prosecutors requested and 20 years longer than the term Rothstein had hoped to receive because of his reportedly extensive cooperation with federal 
investigator. Mm. So he's still in prison, uh, which is good because you can't take people's money and do things with it that they don't know that you're doing with it. It's not okay. I'm sure someone in prison has figured out a way to still run a Ponzi scheme. Like, Oh, for sure. Anything can happen in America. Absolutely. Now, as I mentioned a little through this, uh, the name Bernie Madoff was mentioned a couple of times. Mm. Now, Bernie Madoff, if you don't know, uh, there is a documentary that's just landed on Netflix, um, which is called Madoff, uh, something like the the worst person on Wall Street or something along those lines. But I watched that recently and it doesn't do it justice to do a little story for him, a little bit in a no. part story. So as a little treat for you all, whether it's a treat or not, I'm going to dedicate an entire episode to Bernie uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So watch the documentary and uh, I really want to focus on the victims um, for that particular story because I'll give you a rundown, but I really want people to hear some more of those stories of people that were affected by it because that's what got me. Yeah. I was like, this is all numbers on a printed piece of paper from a dot matrix printer but these this is people's livelihoods this is their future these yeah. are their kids future this is and it's not a little thing it's not yeah it's not a white collar crime when it comes down to people's lives so that is my episode entitled Ponzi. Gave you a little rundown on who Charles Ponzi was and what he did to uh, get the name um, and then people to continue using that with, uh, you know, all the schemes that they did. How exciting. Well done, Kate. That was yeah. that was a big one. Like It was. There's a lot to it. And there is also, I am aware, sometimes this kind of topic, you know, it can switch people. It can be a bit of a snooze fest. Uh, so, you know, try to keep it light, keep it quick, keep it happening. I find it interesting and it certainly is a fear of, millions of people all around the world in terms of losing all of their money which would be shit uh my pop culture reference for this week as well is really just a personal favorite uh it's wall street uh with michael douglas and charlie sheen it's one of my favorite movies of all time dominic and i will do a little bonus episode on that i have something that you know i want to share with you all but that will be available on our patreon so make sure you go and sign up for that so you can hear me uh, just gushing over 1980s Michael Douglas <laughs> for like half an hour. Oh, That's God. all it is. It's just me heavily breathing into the microphone whilst the movie plays in the background. Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> so keep your peepers peeled for those, you absolute beautiful legends. God, I love every one of you. Yeah. I love you like I love 1980s Michael Douglas. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well done, Kate. That was pretty epic and we're terrible at math. But I think scams are sort of the new hot topic for true crime at the moment because, yeah. you know, the, the whole murder, 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 murder stuff, we've had that for a few years now and it, it's, you know, it's a bit much. But I feel like there's this new sort of trend in the past year or so of exploring different types of scams so doing the pon the original ponzi and then some good examples is really cool and mm. interesting Excellent. but kate before uh -oh. we wrap up yes and for those that are listening to this while we were recording we just hit our 500th follower on instagram Woo! Mr. Who is Ken it? kenneth jason mosty Hi, Kenneth Jason Mosty, KJM. Has a personal blog and is a horror movie fanatic. Amazing. So a uh, shout out to you. We'll do a special little social media post as well. Thank you for being our 500th follower. It's Yay. just up from here, Kate. So oh, it is. The sky's the limit. So exciting. All right, folks. So please don't forget, please go check out our Patreon. Please rate and review us because it's yeah. so so very helpful and if you want to ever chat to us or contact us all you need to do is email us at shitting.bricks.podcast at gmail.com awesome. tell us a story reach out Please. to us tell us what you're scared of yeah we'll tell look us into it and we may even do an episode of it we may yeah. even invite you to be on the episode so that's right if you want to jump on a pod get in touch with us we'd love to hear from you all right thank you kate 
Love Thanks, you. Dom. Love you too. It's so good to see you. you I'll too. see you soon. Bye, everyone. Love you. Bye. Bye.